In order for us to have compassion, we have to make mistakes. We have to have people tell us we're not perfect, too. Hi, I'm Gracie Mercedes, and welcome back to Not Blink Enough, a podcast about everyday insecurities and triumphs. In this episode, I'm talking with Laura Bell Bundy, the Tony-nominated Broadway and TV actress and singer, talks about what it was like being a child actor, model, and pageant girl, her split upbringing between Kentucky and New York City, and the challenges mothers face when working in Hollywood. All this and more in this lively conversation we titled, Not Famous Enough. Hi, Laura Bell Bundy. Welcome to Not Blank Enough. Hi. (laughs) You look adorable in your closet. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's always a topic of conversation since COVID started that my office is actually, you know, it's a small office room, but then I made it a walk-in closet because there's no closet space in this house. It's amazing. Thank you. But it was like never a thing until, you know, COVID and everything became over Zoom. And so every time I have a Zoom meeting, people are like, are you in your closet? I'm like, yeah, but it's actually my office. (laughs) Uh, but how are you doing? I'm better than I, I think I finally allowed myself to feel a little joy and relief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think like the, the first couple of hours after the announcement that, uh, we would have a new president, I was like, I can't, (laughs) I can't allow myself to feel good. I totally get it. I still don't a hundred percent feel it. Like, I'm like, I will believe it on January, on January 20th when it's really, really said and done, but yeah. I am also very relieved. And Saturday was a great day. Yeah, it was. And well, here's the thing. As soon as you, cause I did eventually the, when they did their speeches and they came out and they were dancing mm-hmm. and the music was playing and I was like, I can't stop moving my body. I can't stop. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? This is, this is actually great. Cause I feel like people did have quite a release mm-hmm. and you know, but if there isn't kind of fucking with this election, if that happens mm-hmm. and it's going to, mm-hmm. I think that people know what it feels like to have experienced the joy and the relief. Mm-hmm. And that is such a powerful emotion and feeling. Oh, yes. Amen. I, I totally get what you're saying. And that's so true. Well, Laura, I'm so happy to have you on this podcast. And usually I start by talking about how I know the person. And we have a funny, unique little story. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we met a bazillion years ago. I mean, that was so long ago. It was, was like 14 years ago, 15 years? 14, 15 sounds right. Yeah, yeah, sure. That sounds right. Yeah. And we were basically dancing partners because (laughs) you were dating a mutual friend of mine's friend, basically. And then um, we all would go out because we were young and, you know, that's what you did on on, on the weekdays and and weekends. (laughs) And you and I would always end up dancing together because you're such a great dancer. And And you're such a great dancer. Everybody was like sitting around talking and drinking and we're like, we're hitting the dance floor. I could always (laughs) rely upon you. I know to that be so my fun. dancing partner. And actually the guy I was with, you know, my boyfriend at the time was quite a good dancer too. You know, yeah. He, yeah. Yeah. The- we had, a, that was a good time. I missed those dancing days. Um, Me too. especially now, especially oh now. Oh my God. Um, but then we kind of loosely like kind of kept in touch through social media. You moved to New York, you went on Broadway, you became a huge star. And then we kind of reconnected in LA mm-hmm. and then you got to be on perfect harmony when I was writing on perfect harmony. So we got to reconnect again. I know. And what, like, I love it. What a like circle of friendship, I think. Um, I know, but I'm excited to talk to you. And usually how we kick it off is that we just have you talk about your upbringing and where you're from and what that was like. I am from Kentucky. Mm, uh, mm-hmm. which made, um, you know, being on perfect harmony, uh, with you pretty authentic because yes. it took place in Kentucky. I'm from Lexington, Kentucky, which is the horse capital of the world, the horse thoroughbred horse racing capital mm-hmm. of the world. Also bourbon nearby is the bourbon capital of the world. I just want to, you know, point Yum. all <laughs> the nation's vices. You've got gambling, you've got bourbon, Love uh, it. <laughs> tobacco. If it's like, you know, right. Yeah, there. I learned a lot about Kentucky working <laughs> on perfect harmony. Cause I knew literally nothing about Kentucky before then, but yeah, it's good to hear these things. And my, my grandfather was a radio DJ in the forties, fifties in Maysville, Kentucky. My grandmother was also from Maysville, Kentucky, a very, very poor upbringing, but she met my grandfather while he was a DJ. I 
at the soda fountain shop. And, <laughs> um, and he went on to do, uh, move to Cincinnati. He trained George Clooney's dad, Nick Clooney in radio. Oh, wow. And gave him his first job. And then to, together they went to Cincinnati. And then my grandfather ended up going to Lexington, Kentucky to begin the on-camera broadcasting news station. And at the time, when you did that, you had to do everything. You did the sports, you did the weather. You were also <laughs> an editor and a cameraman. I mean, right. you did everything. You were like, he had a show called the Mr. Worm Show for kids. I mean, he was doing everything. And my mom, when she was a little girl, would go and watch my grandfather at work mm. and she'd go play in the props and stuff. And I think my mom kind of got the stars in her eyes from watching that with my grandfather. Aww. I tell this story because this is part of the evolution of how I ended up getting into the business, but, right. um, oh my God, my aunt Marcia was miss, miss Lake Cumberland. What? Yes. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot to tell oh you that my, my aunt Marcia was Miss Lake Cumberland. And we're saying this because because on perfect harmony, perfect yeah. harmony and suddenly Cumberland. Yes. Um, so my mother could find talent in other people, see it. She didn't feel like she had it, but she could huh. tell them how to use it. Uh -huh. You know, and she, uh -huh. she, she, she could be pretty bossy about it too. And then I came around, I popped out of her vagina and she was like, <laughs> There she is, Miss America. This was going to be her <laughs> chance to um, raise a Miss America. And then she put me in some pageants as like a little kid. And oh when I was God. five, I won a brand new car. I won a pageant and a brand new car at five. What? Why would they give, why would that be the prize of a pageant for five-year-olds? I don't know. You know what? <laughs> They're safer on the road. They don't get drunk. They... <laughs> You know, it's like ice, you know, lots of sugar, but that, that's about it. I don't so know. You started it's just young. So the parents can have some money. I don't know. My mother's right. like, we'll take the money. <laughs> and my dad had a business. Uh, he was an electrical engineer and an entrepreneur. He started a business from the ground up in Kentucky called Bluegrass oh. Manufacturing. Are you an only child? I have two older half sisters. Okay. From my father's first marriage. Got it. But in the household, you didn't really grow up with them, though. So in the household, it was just you? In the household, it was mostly me. My middle sister, April, mm -hmm. she's about 11 and a half years older than I am. Mm -hmm. So when I was younger, she was around. But eventually, right. she graduated. She left the home and right, right. all of that. So it really was me. And then mm -hmm. at one point, I went to New York City. And so my life was kind of going back and forth between New York City and Kentucky. Wait, why did you go to New York City? Well... I was invited to the Phil Donahue show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep talking. You know, free trip to New York. My mom mm. was so excited. We're going to stay at the Sheridan Hotel and have cheesecake at Lindy's. And so we went to Kmart to get our new clothes. Oh my God, I love this. And also I got a whole new pageant dress that she had designed for me by this guy. I think his name was Rico. And I'm pretty sure he was operating like a Filipino sweatshop right. upstairs at a townhouse in Lexington, yeah. Kentucky. But there was always a weird burning smell of a glue gun whenever I entered. And, and I remember distinctly where he kept this box of snacks where you could put the money in the box and then grab the snack out. Do you remember those? Oh my those? God. Oh my God. I do. I do know what you're talking about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like this was the cheap way to have a snack machine. Yeah. Anyway, so we have, we take our dress and all this stuff. We go to New York city. Now, we why are the, you going to the Phil Donahue show? They were doing a whole episode on children's pageants. Oh God. So course. they invited me and a bunch of other pageant children and their parents, mostly their moms mm -hmm. to this thing. And I remember being backstage and my mom was like, she saw another girl. Okay. First of all, I look like a drag queen. Okay. I got a <laughs> face full of makeup. Big, big age. So it's really there. like um, toddlers and tiaras. Yeah. Like, yes. yes. Ex okay. Except I might have had a flipper as well. I, I, I did have a flipper at one point in my life. That's the fake teeth thing? Yes. 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 Okay. I uh -huh. actually think at that time I didn't have a flipper, but, and you know, we didn't do spray tans. We just really, we just did the tanning bed. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember this girl using glitter hairspray. Uh -huh. My mom was like, First of all, she had teased my hair to the high heavens and put hairspray on it. And she says to me, we don't use glitter. It's not classy. <laughs> <laughs> like I 
Laura, you need to do a one woman show if you haven't done so already, because this is just so entertaining. So, okay. So you do the Phil Donahue show and what happens after okay. that? Okay. Well, <laughs> we get on stage, I dress, I do my little walk and everything. Mm-hmm. I turn around. I think mm-hmm. I'm so cute. I'm on national television. It's very exciting. They bring on child psychologists. The audience turns against the oh, the parents God. and it's like, I can't believe you're doing this to your daughter. She's like a wind up <gasps> toy, blah, blah, blah. My mother gets up to defend herself. I, there's footage of this. I go and reach for Donahue's mic. I don't remember this part. And I tell him I like pageants and I like modeling and I like commercials. And you see my mom's mouth in the video of this. You see my mom's mouth moving, you know, when I'm saying these things like, yeah, yeah, like she had coached me, I guess. I don't know. And so then we leave and, you know, of course it's like, I can't believe they told us to come out of New York City to make asses of us. And I can't believe it. And she is livid and she is going to shine this turd. Mm. Or as my father used to say, turn chicken shit into chicken salad. And she (laughs) waltzes my little ass all the way across town. And by Uh the way, we go to 59th and 1st Street. And if you've ever lived in New York City, Mm -hmm. you know that there's no subway Mm -mm. on 1st Avenue. The last one is like Lexington. And then you got to walk big Mm -hmm. avenue blocks. So I'm Mm -hmm. like five. It's rainy and cold in New York City. Mm -hmm. It's a long way to go. All I want is a hot dog off the street. And my mom waltzes my ass over to Ford Modeling Agency. Of course. And she's like, of course. We're here to see the children's division. And and they say, ma'am, do you have an appointment? She's like, well, I seen in a picture and they said, if you're ever in New York City, that you should come back. And they're like, well, ma'am, you need an appointment. (laughs) She's like, well, this is Miss Pee Wee Hemisphere. And if you're going to meet her, you're going to need to meet her now because we're leaving tomorrow. Wow. And they let us up. Wow. Five flights of steps all the way up. It's like the longest walk of my life. And then we get there and I talk to them and they end up signing me to a five-year contract. Of course, because you're probably just the most adorable little blonde hair, blue eyed, all American girl. <laughs> They're like, let's snatch her up now. <laughs> so they signed me to this and my, mom, my mom's like, oh shit, what did I get into? We don't live here, right? Right. They're like, well, there's this thing called the summer kids and Mm -hmm. you could be a summer kid and come to New York in the summers and then go back to Kentucky for the school year Mm -hmm. and whatever other work like my mom would have to do because she worked with my father at at their company. So we did that starting at age six until I was nine. And then when I was nine, I ended up getting my first theatrical job. But I mean, those summers I spent in New York, so did, we, you, I, did you like it? Did you like doing it at such a young age? I think I liked the attention. Mm. I have always been a little bit of a clown and, and I like that. I, I thought modeling was incredibly boring mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. if I had to stay, stand still. Now, if they turned on the music and I could like move around and dance uh-huh, and stuff, uh-huh. it was super fun. Or if there was like another girl there that was, you know, yeah. that I could make friends with and had, I loved it. But most of the time I thought it was just so boring. And when we were up there, my mom would have me at all of the dance classes at Broadway Dance Center and singing teachers. And and as I started to do that, the musical theater aspect Mm. of it and seeing the shows in New York and stuff, I loved it. And I loved New York City. I Mm. mean, I saw my first hooker at eight. And I think because I felt like I was selling myself too. Yeah. Um, Oh, that's interesting. It was like a a kinship (laughs) So did you realize that that at such a young age, did you think like, I mean, like part of you was like, I'm kind of selling myself here? Well, I knew that I was, was selling mm-hmm. what I was selling was myself. I, I don't know if I totally made the connection right between it. I'm pretty sure my mom said at some point, listen, if you don't do good at this audition, you're going to turn out to be like that. Oh you know, God. like I really think, I mean, she was really very funny the way that she communicated with me. Like I even, I was eight, we were living on 31st in this walk up apartment. We called the rat hole. Cause there was always these mice running around. It was across the street from an abortion clinic and next to a oh Lebanese restaurant that taught me to spell my name in Arabic. And then we would go out at night. And I remember seeing this, what I thought was a beautiful, sexy woman that looked like she was in an Aerosmith video leaning into a car window. And I was like, mommy, what's she doing? Oh my God. And she's like, well, that girl is doing things you shouldn't do until you're married for money. Oh my God. How old were you when that happened? Eight. 
Oh my God. And she's like, and you see that man over there with that coat on and that hat? That's what you call a pimp. Oh my. And she Stop it, Laura. works for him and he protects her, but he also drugs her. He keeps her in it. This is what they do to these poor, innocent girls that get off the bus from Minnesota. They end up working the streets because they get them stuck on drugs and then they got to do this. It's never ending. You, This is why it is so important that you stay in and you do good in school <laughs> and you get that and you get that Cheerios commercial, honey. You oh, my that. God. Okay. You know what I mean? This is like. Okay, I grew up in New York City, so I know exactly what you were seeing, and I know all the things, and I don't even think I ever put any of that together or was told anything about it. I just was like, this is my environment. But also, I'm way older than my siblings, and my sister, who's nine years younger than me, she was a model for Ford when she was like five. And I was the one at like 16, 15, taking her to her like go sees and to her castings and stuff. And she liked it for about a year and then she hated it and was super bored and we ended up stopped doing it. But I know a little bit about that world and, and the moms in that world. And I remember thinking like, cause I was just like the teenage sister bringing her around. I was not that at all, but seeing some of these moms as a teenager being like, Oh my God, these poor children. <laughs> and so it's like definitely like the, the momager. What is it? Did I say it? Momager? Like manager? Yeah. Momager. Momager. And and so like, what, what was your relationship with your mom then? Did you think like my mom's the greatest and she's hilarious? And like, did you see the humor in all this? Or were you like, mom, stop it. Like, how I, did you see her at that age? I see the humor now. Right. <laughs> I mean, I see the humor now and I took her word for it. You mm-hmm. know, at the time I was like, oh, this is I better, you know, like, yeah. you know, I took her word for it. I did think my mom was the greatest mm. and I did think she was strong and resilient. And I Mm -hmm. saw her like carrying a bag of quarters around so she could call the the people to, to see if we had an audition Mm -hmm. and walking around New York city with a huge bag on her, her back with anything I could need if I had a job and not having enough money to afford more than a, a hot dog off the street and a cup of noodles because we were in New York city and we were from Kentucky and it was expensive to be there. And then figuring out how she was going to be able to afford to show me the statue of Liberty or take me on a train oh. to go to the beach in the summer. Oh. So I think I saw her hustle. I saw her hustle. Yeah. I saw her strength. I saw her suffer, like mm. hide her tears when things were hard. And mm-hmm. I saw her be scared and then tell me how to put a tough look on my face to walk down the street because we were getting cat called mm-hmm. like, Hey mommy, Hey baby, yeah, you need money. York. Call Mikey, oh, you know? I, yep. uh, and then I also saw her like generosity of being a Southern woman in New York, I saw, I saw her come with prejudice Mm -hmm. and I saw her leave New York city without it. I saw her strength. I saw her resilience. I also was incredibly embarrassed by her at times. Right. And it was all of of everything. It it was all of that. Yeah. And that makes total sense. And, and sticking with the theme of the show at that point, as a child going through this very different childhood, running around auditioning, being on set as a kid, what that's like wearing those fake teeth when you have to (laughs) lose your teeth. My sister hated those things. I remember having to put it on like in her mouth with like denture glue yes. and she was yeah. like freaking out it was like horrible I have PTSD from it so I can't imagine what she does and so in this experience as a five-year-old six-year-old seven-year-old eight-year-old was there ever a feeling now in retrospect of feeling not blank enough and what was that blank this is the two things are coming to mind and I don't know how to put it one is not good enough mm-hmm. and one is not normal enough yeah unpack that not normal enough a little bit Like I definitely noticed that I had a different life than other kids I went to school with. Mm -hmm. I definitely knew that I was exposed to more than they were. I was working as a child. Did you feel proud of that or ashamed of it? Or did the other kids know that you did this? And did they see you in commercials and things like that? Yes. And I was teased for it when I got back to school. Of course. I was in a dress and dazzle, dress and dazzle commercial. And this kid came up and was like dazzling, you know, to me and teasing me in a high school. My nickname was Jumanji because I had been in Jumanji. While I love my experiences in New York and I, as I look back on them, I know that they shaped me and they built who I am and they make me laugh. At the time I felt I was missing out on my childhood. 
Which is kind of the story of most childhood actors, I feel like, and kids. Yeah. It's whether it's, so I want to say it's like, I'm not a kid enough. Not a child enough. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't get to have that. Not a child enough. That that normal quote unquote childhood experience. And, And let me tell you, I spent my entire adulthood reclaiming Mm. my youth, meaning everything I do now is a spirit of play. Mm. So I think that what I turned it into was something that could have been a very negative thing in my life is that I turned this career into an opportunity to play. So whether that's to do plays and play on stage or play music, Mm -hmm. it's all around a spirit of play. And I really love that. And then in other ways, you know, you see almost every child actor do that thing where they hit that age where they're, you can't control me anymore. This isn't up to you. This is about me. I'm going to have some fun. The rebellious age. Yeah. Right. And then they get shit for it. But really, it's just a natural evolution of who they are and what needs to come out. Mm. They need to be able to make their own decisions. They need to let loose. They need to feel like they can just do whatever they want and play because that time where that the imagination was engineered when they were young right. and they need a time where it's not engineered. It's just imagination. It's just fun. For me, I think it's, I have in a creative way channeled that desire to be playful And then I definitely avoided commitment for a really, really long time, Mm -hmm. you know, because it was just like (laughs) nothing was going to control me and nothing was going to like, because everything had been so controlled. Yeah. That's so interesting because the average child, their only real structure is when they're in school and then they have, of course, the rules of their parents, but then they get to play and they get to have their summers and they get to do all this fun stuff. Whereas the role of a child actor or model is structure in school, structure at home, and then you go to work like an actual adult and you have rules and you have to be there at a certain time and you have to actually put in the time to work. That totally makes sense that then you at some point rebel against that or just want to be as childlike as possible because you feel like you missed out on that a bit. Yeah. So you started pretty young and then you said in high school you did Jumanji, the movie? Yeah, I was I was before high school when I did it. I was in the eighth grade, the original Jumanji. Oh, wow. I played young Bonnie Hunt in that. Aww. And um, I obviously don't Google people before I <laughs> interview them. That's um, okay. I actually do when I don't know the person, but I didn't even think to do it with you. <laughs> I'm not particularly known for being in Jumanji, but it was just, but as a child, and I started a new high school, I was the girl who had been exactly. in Jumanji. So right. I ran track and I would go run around the football field mm-hmm. and there would be um, practice for the football players. Uh-huh. And while I was running, they'd go, Jumanji! Oh, 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 ah, ah. oh my Literally God. while I was like, I was like, really? Oh my God. Kids are the worst. <laughs> They're the worst. They're now so what's mean. so funny though, is that my cousin who I ran track with, her husband is that guy's cousin that okay. we used to yell Jumanji used to at, yell at you. <laughs> <laughs> and actually we ended up becoming good friends. I ended oh, up becoming great friends with the football team and dated a football player. But oh. I just think that's so funny is this, this huge memory that I have of course. From, from high school is he's now like in your family <laughs> related to me. And then at what point did you move to New York? Cause you went to New York before LA. Yes. Yeah. So I spent the summers in New York city from the time I was six till I was nine. Then I spent full years there. So Mm -hmm. nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. One of those years I was on tour doing a tour of the sound of music with Marie Osmond when I was like 12, 13. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to school in my freshman year. Then Mm -hmm. after that, I went back to New York. I had applied to go to NYU, was planning to start my year. And then I ended up deferring because I got a soap opera. Oh, wait, we're around the same age. I went to NYU. We probably would have been there at the same time. What? Yeah. I didn't go for, I didn't go for acting though. I went for journalism, broadcast journalism from 96 to 2000. I think I'm older than you though. So I graduated in 99 high school. I graduated high school. (laughs) Shut up. <laughs> um, so we would only we would have only so we'd have caught each other like, in like for one like a year. year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. So what soap opera were you on? I was on Guiding Light. 
growing up in New York, that was the only thing that really shot in New York were the soap operas. And I, I was, my family was a big channel seven fan. So it was like all my children, all ABC. One, yeah. One <laughs> life to live all ABC. But I remember when I did think about acting, wanting to be on a soap so bad. And my first job was as a nurse on all my children. <laughs> you know, and that was it. Then I didn't really act until I moved to LA like years later, but it was fun to be on that set. So my first job on TV was also all my children. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> I was like a balloon girl or something like that. And all uh, so when I was like a kid, oh of my course. God, that's so funny. And then after Guiding Light, what did you do? While I was doing Guiding Light, there was an audition for the first reading of Hairspray. A few years before that, I had uh, done this workshop of this, ended up being a movie called Camp. Mm. And I played the bitch because- You're pretty good at that. I'm pretty good at being a bitch. (laughs) (laughs) And it's typecasting. And and the casting director was the same. So I remember that they had me come in for Amber Von Tussle. Now, what they didn't realize is when I lived in the rat hole across the street from the abortion clinic, I watched Hairspray, the movie with Ricky Lake every day day when I ate my TV dinner. I love that movie. Okay. So when they had me come in, I was so excited. I told them how much I love the movie and how I also loved Amber Von Tussle when they, you know, got the pimple out. That was just so gross and awesome. (laughs) Also, by the way, do you ever go down the rabbit hole of watching people pop pimples online? I find it so disgusting, but my sister was telling you earlier, loves it and watches it all the time. And I'm like, I can't do it. I, I love the satisfaction of popping my own pimples, but I cannot see someone else's <laughs> at all. Two oh, of my on. best friends who are twins are obsessed with it. And I kind of get it. Like I can appreciate it because I certainly liked the Amber Von oh, <laughs> So anyway, I end up auditioning and getting this part. They don't okay. even have a first act. So, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> they first. don't even have a second act. Got it. <laughs> there was no first act. There was no second act. We just sat in a no circle play. and stared at each other. <laughs> um, but we did this first reading. Now, I was still doing Guiding Light at the right. time. Mm-hmm. And I just happened to get the week off to be able to do this reading. And the next reading, I wasn't able to get the week off. So I missed that one. There was two more readings. I was able to do those. And then we ended up, when I left Guiding Light, a few months later, Hairspray oh, wow. ended up coming into fruition and they offered wow. me the part and rehearsals started and stuff like that. What amazing timing. Well, it was amazing timing because I was let go. Well, I wasn't really let go of guiding like my contract wasn't renewed. That, from what I hear of soap opera contracts, they can be pretty strict as far as being able to do anything else. And obviously when you're doing a Broadway show, you can't do anything else anyway. So that was kind of a blessing in disguise, it sounds like. When I look back at things that didn't happen the way I thought that I wanted them to. That is one of those times where I go, the universe was kicking me out of a job I would have stayed in forever because of the security Mm -hmm. and comfort is suicide. Mm -hmm. And I needed to be kicked out so that I could be available for this other job. And that's that thing of like, don't stand there staring at a closed door, turn around and look at the other one open behind you. You know, that was really a big lesson for me that I was glad I learned at a really young age and I, how I have to approach all of the sense of rejection that I get from our career that can be exactly. so frustrating exactly. at times. Exactly. But yeah, it was a big one. And, you know, it was honestly for some silly, like I had gained weight. I was literally released from this job because I couldn't figure out why I was gaining weight. No way. And it's also made me this sort of like, oh, this business is such shitty bullshit yeah. to women in their bodies. Yeah. Well, it turns out I had a gluten allergy and a wheat allergy and oh. I was just swollen. <laughs> as soon Holy as I figured that out, wow. it was like, you know, oh. but it's also a really frustrating thing to feel like something that was, had become like a horrible feeling about my own body was mm-hmm. also the reason I, but it was very vindicating. That's so interesting on so many levels because one, I feel like that can never, no one can get away with that now. Like that would be a huge deal. I mean, I'm sure they do it still, but they wouldn't be able to flat out be like, um, you can't lose weight. So you're fired or you can't lose weight. So we're not renewing your contract. And then on the second part, what I was thinking was like, how did you feel 
knowing that? Like, how did you go to work every day knowing that? And like, what was it? That must have been a, a not blank enough there. Like, what were you feeling? Well, definitely not thin enough. Right. Yeah. I mean, when you go in and you, you know, you go into the wardrobe room and they're right. trying things on you and they know, you know, they're like, uh, it doesn't look right. By the way, I was not obese by any means. Right. You know, I just was a young 20 something mm-hmm. woman, 18 to 20, who was like figuring out what to do. I was like all into the fat free craze and I had a gluten allergy. It was like the worst thing I could have done. But yeah, it was, it didn't feel good. And then to not know what it was and to try all these different fad diets and feel like I was just constantly counting calories while I, you know, and it mm-hmm. was just, it was just very difficult. And I mm-hmm. think a lot of women know how that feeling of having this weird relationship with food or weird relationship with working out. Like there was a gym at the, at the place and I would work out for two, over two hours a day. Wow. And by the way, I was getting pretty muscular (laughs) too. You know, (laughs) you just couldn't, you just couldn't see it. The woman who played my mom on the show, Kim Zimmer is just incredible. I actually loved that cast and the people there. And I so much, they were such a family to me. I really just loved them so much. And I remember her having the same sort of struggles Mm. and being really angry with how they treated me about it. And there was another young woman who has gone on to be quite famous, who also dealt with the same things and end up having a, an eating disorder from from that show. Oh, well, anyway, moving on. There we go. Moving on. (laughs) Um, so you got to do this amazing Broadway show hairspray. How long did you do that for? on a Broadway officially a year, but Mm -hmm. rehearsals and stuff before that, you add like four months. And then when did Legally Blonde come into play? Was that right after? No, I did. I was Kristen Chenoweth's standby in Wicked after Hairspray. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I actually moved to LA for a while. That's when I danced with you. Oh my God. And that's when you did, weren't you in Rock of Ages? Yes. 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 Okay. So yeah, when I came out, I was just, you know, being in LA. Yeah. Doing your thing. <laughs> doing my thing. Date my boyfriend from Santa Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I ended up missing doing theater. I did the workshop of Rock of Ages and simultaneously around that time, I, I go to Connecticut to do this little play. And while I'm there, they say there's this audition, a reading, the first mm-hmm. reading of Legally Blonde. And so I go and I went in and auditioned and it was a lot of material to learn. I remember I was learning it like, I was like learning it in every break I had while I was doing this play, you know, taking walks. I was in Connecticut. I was taking walks and listening to the lines over and over and over and trying to memorize these songs. Then I took the train into the city, stayed with my friend who had a baby. So I couldn't sing the songs late at night. And I would go to the (laughs) West side highway, literally went to the West side highway and sang at midnight the songs oh as god. loud as you could so much better oh my god if there was a camera that had the footage of me acting it out singing i look like you know a typical new york yeah but that's so new york <laughs> <laughs> no one would person. no one would blink an eye at that <laughs> they'd be like oh <laughs> yeah another crazy yeah so that was the beginning of that and that was very similar in terms of development like hairspray you know a couple mm-hmm. readings we did a workshop and then but eventually- now you're the star of the show Like, what was that like? Well, it was definitely a very large sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I definitely felt like every time we did a reading or a workshop, I was still auditioning. You know, Mm -hmm. I didn't have that job for sure. So it was always like, wanted to be on my game and make sure that everything was flawless. Mm -hmm. And I listened and all that. And I grew a lot as an actor. That's an understatement. It was incredible growth. Mm. in terms of the things that I learned. But yeah, I I felt the weight of that responsibility for sure. I mean, I know one's a movie, one's a show, but were you constantly being compared to Reese Witherspoon? I wasn't. No, okay. Well, that's good. (laughs) I wasn't. Jerry Mitchell had said to me after I got the part, I don't want you to ever watch the movie again now. Oh, good. So maybe people behind my back were like, oh, she's so Reese Witherspoon. Right, right. Reese Witherspoon enough or whatever they said. They just didn't tell me. I sort of was like, okay, what are the characteristics of Elle? I did my own backstory into who I think she is. Mm -hmm. And then I just stepped on stage as her or stepped Mm -hmm. into rehearsal as her. I wore like pink every single day. I mean, pink on pink on pink on pink. And I would watch (laughs) 
walk down Times Square because that was like my little route or yeah. to take the subway in all this pink. Oh and my just God, I love it. Feel what the look, like the looks of people looking at me and dolled up and everything. Like, yeah. what, how was my experience of the world different than when I dressed like myself and I wore black? Yeah, and that's such a like L thing to be like the girl everyone's looking at. Like, yeah. <laughs> just based off the movie at least. And then when did you come back to LA? That took a while because after okay. Legally Blonde, I moved to Nashville and I lived in Nashville for five years. Oh, and that's when you got into doing your albums and, and songwriting yeah. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And before you get to that, so you spent most of your life on stage and, and a big part of it on Broadway, which is a huge accomplishment. But was there ever uh, not blank enough in that arena when it comes to being on stage? Oh, yeah. Whether it was like not strong enough vocally or not, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, mm-hmm. But it was mostly like not famous enough because the thing is with, I got very lucky to be able to be the lead of a Broadway show and to have not been a household name because it got to that point on Broadway that if you were going to be the star of a Broadway show, you had to have a star Mm -hmm. attached. Mm -hmm. So you definitely felt that not famous enough or not. That's a good one. That's a really good one, actually, because I totally get that. And I feel like anyone who's in entertainment and maybe even not entertainment, I would I would assume there is that feeling of not famous enough, even if you're not in entertainment, because it could be like you're just not known enough in your field. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming that's the parallel in all the conversations I've had. That's never come up. And I think that's a really interesting thing to unpack because that's such a Ooh, that's such a thing that we all kind of struggle with and a little bit of an imposter syndrome thing or just not being as talented, as smart as this, as that, as the other, but not famous enough. That's a, that's a good one. That's a good one, Laura. Well, it's also something interesting is that when I was doing Ruthless, mm-hmm. which was a show I did when I was 10 and 11 years old, it was a musical I did, uh, an off-Broadway musical. I played a little girl who killed another little girl for a part in the show. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it was a comedy. Wait, I think my friend, was Lacey Chabert in that too? No, she wasn't, but she was my friend. Okay. I remember. I knew she, her when she was a kid. So her, sis, her sister, Chrissy, was my best friend in high school. And we all lived in Battery Park City together. So there is a good chance I met you when you were a child. <laughs> it's very possible. It is it's, very, because I'm like, Ruthless, I think I want to see it with them or something. That's very possible because we were very close with the Shabera family. Yes. My mom. And I taught Lacey how to tap dance when she was auditioning oh for Gypsy. God. This is blowing my mind. In the right living now. room, very good friends with Lacey Shabera. Mm-hmm. Britney Spears was my first understudy. Oh my Natalie God. Portman was my second understudy. Oh my, I got, my best friend was for a time was Macaulay Culkin. I was surrounded by all of these people who went on to have this incredible amount of fame. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially Britney Spears. Right. And then I always sort of felt like my mom was disappointed that I Mm -hmm. hadn't. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I feel that sometimes gnawing on my sense of self and my career as if, you know, why didn't I go on to have those you know, this massive fame. And then I also at the same time feel such incredible gratitude for my anonymity Mm. and my freedom, because the thing that I truly want the most in my life or wanted the most was freedom. Mm. Mm -hmm. That little girl that I'm not a child enough, Right. that girl wanted to just be free. I kind of do that dance between Mm -hmm. what it takes out of you to be famous and gives to you in terms of opportunities for you to play on a, on a larger scale. I'm always going between those two things. Yeah. That makes Um, sense. But I just feel like, you know, there's, there's these experiences that I had of being able to go back to high school and be normal Mm -hmm. in air quotes and to have privacy and to make mistakes without people seeing them. And I made a lot of mistakes and I firmly believe mistakes are required Mm -hmm. to become a full, better, more realized version of yourself. They are required. They're required in order for us to have compassion. Mm -hmm. We have to make mistakes. We have to have people tell us we're not perfect too. Yeah, oh, this makes so much sense. And I totally get what you're saying because so many people that you have mentioned, they also go through 
huge lulls in their careers because of the fame in a sense. Whereas you seem to have had a very steady career of just being a working actor, which is amazing. Whereas I think sometimes when you are quote unquote too famous, <laughs> you're like hot and then you're not, and then you're hot again. And then maybe you're never hot again. Or then, you know what I mean? Versus that mid-level of fame where you can kind of work when you want to work and then, and come in and out of it. And people are not trying to figure out where you went or figure out why you're coming back and you're making a comeback. And what are you making a comeback with? Does that make sense? Like, I feel like there's less pressure about what you choose to do with your career versus when you are like hugely famous and people are like constantly scrutinizing what you decide to do. Yeah. I also think that the way that you see yourself is different, right? So Mm -hmm. you don't see yourself in having these massive heights and then nobody wants you anymore. Right. Like I definitely feel like one thing has always led to another thing has led to right. another thing. It's led. Yeah. To, it's like a very slow and steady climb. Yep. And I think the thing that I feel the most gratitude for is that, you know, the worst thing that can happen is when you get an opportunity and you're not prepared for it. Yeah. There's been so much learning and so much growth and so much soul searching so many experiences and mistakes that have added wisdom that you can now be responsible with yourself and your heart and other people when you do get those big chances that you're not a real asshole. (laughs) No, absolutely. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's a groundedness that I don't think I would trade for the world. No, I totally get it. I totally get it. And I'm right there with you. I've always said that when I started pursuing acting, I was like, I just want to (laughs) work. Like, I don't want to be this famous person who can't have a a quote unquote normal life because it's weird. And I've been working when I worked at MTV, I've I've been around that. Like I was around a lot of famous people all the time. And anytime I had to like be in the outside world with this person to feel the world, just constantly looking at them and staring at them to me, that felt so uncomfortable. And I'm like, these people have to live like this every day of their lives. Like they can't just go to the supermarket without everyone just all eyes on you. Hey, what do you look like? Who's And now it's even worse with cameras and everyone has a freaking camera on their phone and paparazzi and all the things. Yeah, it's very, it's incredibly invasive. Yeah. I mean, you know, with many people who have that kind of celebrity, what they would give to just be able to go to the grocery store without any makeup on and like, just yeah. say like, whatever. I think there are certain areas where people are sort of like unaffected by any of that, you know, so <laughs> yeah. of New York or yeah, LA, yeah, yeah, but you know, you go anywhere else, you're in an airport, you're in a mm-hmm. theme park, you know, a mall. Good luck. So moving on to today, Laura Bell Bundy today, <laughs> what's going on? What are you, what are you up to now? You know, when you talk to me about what's going on now, because I definitely want to know what's going on now. I do also want to know if your feelings of not blank enough have changed, evolved, are still the same. Are there still those feelings of not childlike enough, not famous enough, not strong enough? I think that was another one. Yeah. Where I am today is I'm a mom. Mm -hmm. And so I made a decision that I was going to finally allow myself to be responsible for another human being. Aww. And that was a real big one for me mm-hmm. because I needed to not feel like I was responsible for my mom's happiness as well as my own. Mm. And it took many years for me to feel like I could just be myself and be independent. And so then to make the decision that I was going to now really be responsible for someone else mm. was a real big one. Because even when you're married, you, you know, if you have a healthy relationship, you're actually not responsible for their happiness. <laughs> right, right, right. You know what I mean? You might yeah. be responsible for covering half, covering half the rent or the mortgage or something, but, right. you know, you're not responsible for their mental and emotional state. You right. can contribute, but mm-hmm. a child is like, this is you carrying it. This is the responsibility. And so in that, I think I've had to grow up a mm-hmm. little bit and I definitely have taken up a cause for women for sure. And the experience of being a woman and the experience of being a mother. And I finished an album called Women of Tomorrow, which de- which each song deals with a different issue that women are facing today, whether that be unrealistic beauty standards, the mental load of motherhood, uh, digital disease is one of the songs, equal pay, uh, wow. <laughs> you know, whatever. We're tackling those things through song and accompanying music videos. And I've been doing that in the pandemic. So I wrote and did half of the album while pregnant. 
And then I finished the other half while in postpartum wow. and nursing, wow. which had a whole amount of struggle in terms of being able to have the mental space to write it. Cause I, I was like all this newness of motherhood was just like, holy crap. There's so many things you think about that you never thought you'd think about. And, you know, as a writer, you kind of need your head to be like a little bit open so you can channel some good ideas. That was a struggle. But then at the same time, I've been very creative, right? So I've created life, Mm -hmm. created this album. Mm -hmm. I created a show a uh, women's history sketch comedy show yes, and sold that. And so this part of me that it was now always playing on stage for people to see is now playing behind the scenes quite a bit more. And the things that I'm creating have a cause. So now it feels like more of a purpose driven playfulness. And, yeah. um, but yeah, this is, this has been a difficult time. COVID has been a difficult time. I had COVID. Right. I remember that now you, yeah, you yeah. talked about it on Instagram. I was fortunate though, that my symptoms weren't extreme and fairly minor, but you know, it's being stuck in the same place with, you know, you don't, you don't get the same stimuli. You don't get the energy. It's like, how do you keep this? How do you keep that energy of play and fun yeah. alive? You so don't get you to know, go dance. You don't get to in real life auditions anymore. It's, no, it's really weird. You don't get yeah. to rehearse and like, mm-hmm. like, you don't get to be in the recording studio, my version of a recording studio in my closet or yeah. whatever, and continue to write or put out yeah. music. Yeah. But it's really, really hard. It's been really, really difficult to also do that and and be mom and all that. Yeah. So real quick, before COVID, I just have to tell this story. <laughs> Oh my God. It was so fantastic. You guys. So Laura Bell Bundy had a recurring guest star on perfect harmony and we had a table read and you know, all our actors are at a table reading the script. Laura, you had your, your beautiful little son in a little, what are those things called? It's like a baby Bjorn, <laughs> like a baby Bjorn, baby carrier. Were you feeding him? You were feeding him. Also <laughs> reading your lines. <laughs> also singing on key perfectly like everyone and you know these these table reads all the writers are in the audience all the big producers all the executives from the network and the studio there's like a, a room full of people <laughs> watching this and Laura was like a superstar mom like it was the most amazing thing I have a photo of it maybe we can get it on show notes somehow but it was just the most incredible thing to see you were like super mom that day and your baby started crying and you were just like rocking him and you kept going you just like turning the page, reading your lines, didn't miss a beat, were hilarious and sang on key. And literally everyone was talking about that for the rest of the day. We were like, oh my God, Laura Bell Bundy. She's like super mom. <laughs> what is going on here? It was incredible. So I just had to give you those props. Oh, okay. thank you. I thought, wow, that was really something. You know what it was? I was a new mom. It was like the postpartum of it all. I didn't have a sitter. Mm. And you know how they are with like, oh, we're having a table read today at one. Hope you can join us. I'm like, you gonna tell me today? <laughs> I do not have time. <laughs> oh, babysitter, like, do you know what I mean? And we and weren't like, even in LA, we were in Chatsworth. <laughs> so somebody, right, Chatsworth, right, right, it's 30 minutes away. Somebody says to me, and I don't remember who it was, but it was a PA or somebody said, we're very baby friendly. Mm-hmm. I'm like, if I come, I'd have to bring him. And they're like, we're very baby friendly. Well, that was all the permission I needed (laughs) because it it was also like an episode I was really in a lot. I wanted to kind of be able to hear it. And I was like, well, what choice do I have? Let's see how this goes. This is adventure. Right. (laughs) Right. It's so cool. It was so cool to watch though. I was changing his poopy diaper right under that table, you know. Oh my God, Laura. I love you. Uh, (laughs) You're amazing. It was, there was something about it when I brought him that was like, you know what? You guys don't make it easy for moms. This industry does Mm -hmm. not make it easy for moms. It does not make it easier for women to rise up through the ranks when you're not giving them enough time to schedule childcare, to do Mm -hmm. something that is kind of a part of their job. The fittings I had to bring him at, I mean, Mm -hmm. everything, people really Mm -hmm. got to know him there, but, (laughs) (laughs) and there was something quite powerful about it. Like, you Mm -hmm. want me to come? I'm bringing him. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was great. And like, it was just done so well that it almost was like, yeah, sure. Anyone can bring their baby. (laughs) (laughs) If you can do that. Yeah, sure. Anyone bring your baby. But it was, it was a friendly in general, like, oh, so sad. I didn't get renewed. I know it was a great cast and crew and and everyone was awesome. People would bring their dogs. People would bring their kids. It was just a very friendly environment. 
I'll tell you, I have two shows that the two TV shows that I did where the vibe of the cast and writers and community was just so joyful and fun, really Mm. fun. And it was Heart of Dixie and Perfect Harmony. They were both set in the South, (laughs) but they both had music. And I think when you put musical theater people Mm. into a TV set, I mean, I got so many giggles. It was so I mean, so many giggles. There were times the camera was rolling and I (laughs) was like trying so hard not to laugh. Oh, I love it. In those big group scenes. Yeah, I love it. It was such a great, oh, I'm going to cry. It was was so much fun. I was so bummed out that it didn't continue to go, mostly because I was going to miss out on that play and that fun. Well, what should we call this episode then? Out of all the not blank enoughs that you mentioned, what do you think is the most prominent for you? I don't know, girl. I'm really not good (laughs) with this. So we talked about not childlike enough. We talked about not famous enough. And we talked about not maybe not strong enough, but I think the not famous enough, you kind of expanded on the most. So Mm -hmm. maybe that's the winner. It is something we haven't heard before, like something definitely a very unique perspective, I think, compared to some of the others. But I really like the not childlike enough. That's also a very unique experience to grow up as a child actor, child model. So it's up to you. I think what we should do, I think not famous enough is pretty interesting. Okay. Because when you're giving up your childhood for fame and then you become adult an adult and you don't have that to the degree that the person who put you in the business thought you should have it. Is there something that you tell yourself I'm a failure mm. because I didn't achieve your dream for me, but you you I can't do that because mm. that actually, I'm not even that person you thought I was that you thrust into those pageants and those jobs. And I'm like the little idiot in there. That's like making jokes and having a good time and all, and just wanting to have fun. Yeah. You're actually very playful and very childlike in a sense. And it's interesting that that was your upbringing because it was almost like, yeah, you can't keep that play out of me, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's go with not famous enough. I love it. Yeah, let's do it. Well, well, thank you, Laura. This has been so fun. It's been so great to catch up and and get your whole timeline of life. (laughs) Oh my God. It's It's such a great perspective. Thanks so much for listening. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, know that you are more than enough. Check the show notes for links and info about today's guest. Follow us on Instagram at notblankenoughpod. This episode was produced during the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 and recorded remotely. Our show is executive produced by Gracie Mercedes and Dave Hill and produced by Douglas Sarine and Colleen Beasley. Not Blank Enough is a Gumption Pictures production.